Welcome all. My name is Frank Reedy, and I'm representing the Strategic Studies Department here at JSAL. Today, we're pleased to present a distinguished speaker, including audience Q&A. This session is unclassified and will be recorded and posted to the JSAL network. Please keep in mind that the views and opinions expressed by all participants do not necessarily reflect the views, opinions, or policies of the U.S. government, Department of Defense, or U.S. SOCOM. If you have questions after this session, please email thinkjsau at socom.mil as indicated on the slide. Since unsettled weather is always a possibility, if you lose connection, just rejoin the session. If the internet fails you, remember that you can always dial in on the phone numbers on your registration email. Today's moderator is Mr. Kerry Roberts, outreach faculty member here at JSAL. He will introduce the program and today's guest. Thanks, Frank, and good morning to everyone. I want to welcome everyone to another online interview with Think JSAL. Think JSAL is an ongoing program that explores research and publications of JSAL faculty, resident senior fellows, leading academics, and the wider soft and international security community. The online collection includes interviews and conversations with authors and researchers, and is intended to supplement existing publications, articles, and other active discussions. I encourage everyone to explore the complete Think JSAL collection by reviewing our online offerings posted to the Strategic Studies Department page through our library on the All Partner Access Network, or APAN, and JSAL social media sites. Today, we would like to welcome Dr. Liam Collins. Dr. Collins is a retired career special forces officer who has served in Afghanistan, Iraq, Bosnia, Africa, and South America. He has served as the director of West Point's Combating Terrorism Center and also director of the Modern Warfare Institute. He has taught courses on a wide variety of military and international relations topics, and he has published new <clears throat> numerous articles on great power competition, security and governance, counterinsurgency, and irregular and hybrid warfare in such publications as the Journal of Strategic Studies, Democracy and Security, and Army Magazine. He has a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering from the United States Military Academy, and a master's in public affairs and a PhD from Princeton University. And he is also a member of the Council on Foreign Relations. He currently serves as the executive director of the Viola Foundation and the Madison Policy Forum. Dr. Collins, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Very welcome. So let's start off. First question, uh, the pivot to great power competition is a topic of high interest in the national security arena today. In an article you co-authored entitled, Dangerous Myths, How the Crisis in Ukraine Explains Future Great Power Conflict, you argue that the Russian aggression against Ukraine and the annexation of the Crimea in 2014, 2015, presents many lessons about the extent and scope of limited conflict in the future. So what sort of activities did Russia engage in and what were the key takeaways about conflict below the threshold of war? Yeah, I guess that's a first. I mean, it shouldn't have come as a major surprise in 2014, at least if we had studied Russia's invasion of Georgia in 2008, um, right? But at that time we were kind of coming off a surge, we were focused elsewhere, but Russia really learned from this experience and really looked to reform its military and its defense strategy and executed that to perfection in Crimea. So again, kind of looking at back at what they did in Georgia and kind of understanding how that impacted what they were able to do in Crimea, right? A combination, right? They tried to, sh information operations, they learned from their mistakes in Georgia. They tried to present that, that conflict, right? As a preempt, right? As Georgia pre preempt, right? As a, it was, you know, Georgia initiated the conflict, but most of the international community really saw it as Georgia preemption, right? Russians were on the border, they were coming across, Georgia just kind of took the first strike. So Russia kind of lost there and kind of reinvested heavily in information operations. Second, what we saw there, right, a, you know, electronic warfare investment in that, right, severed the communications between the capital and the forces out in the field, uh, right, so that, you know, try to paralyze them. Uh, we see, you know, it's the first time in Georgia where we see, you know, cyber combined with lethal kinetic operations. The year prior, right, we saw a denial of service attack.
for political purposes in Lithuania, but there's operations uh, in Georgia. Uh, and, and, then, and then in Georgia, really what they learned, the other big thing that they learned there is, right, conventional forces coming across the border, large Russian formations, just doesn't give them any plausible deniability, right? The fact that they were sitting on the other side of the border waiting to roll, kind of, you know, debunked, right, their message that it was, you know, Georgia initiating it. Uh, and so what they learned from that, and that's why we saw in Crimea, right, the little green men at the time, and ultimately, right, executed, seized, right, and annexed Crimea within 30 days without firing a shot, right, purely masterful. Again, certain inherent advantages that they had there, but what we saw there, right, a combination, right, heavy investment in, uh, right, in influence operations, right, information operations, IO, right, heavily invested there, right, controlling media monopoly, right, controlling the radio stations, TV stations. Again, they had inherent advantages because they controlled most of the Russian-speaking media outlets, which is what they all were in Crimea, and a large part to the uh, southeast in, in Ukraine, right, electronic warfare, right, severing the communications, right, so they're, the, the military units that are there are paralyzed, right, a use of proxies, right, the same kind of going back to the Cold War, whether it's blackmailing, making them, uh, you know, bribing them, whatever it takes, right, so it's something as simple as, in, right, instead of engaging the Ukrainian military, just bribe the armor so they can't get into the armed room and get their arms, or making a protest or, right, getting a bunch of people out in front of the, the base so they can't get on the base, and never mind, right, the communications are, you know, severed, so they aren't getting anything from Kiev of what to do, but, right, the key is, right, on the little green men, right, at the time, right, the media was like, who are these people, right, if you kind of go back in time, remember who they are, and it's because of, right, the disinformation, again, Russia investing heavily uh, in information operations. I mean, I challenge anybody in the audience, go to any international hotel and tell me where, and, and, and turn on the TV and, and, and look and see if you don't see RT on there, right? Um, but, you know, so the little green men, you know, who did it give plausible deniability to? I argue it's not the Russians they gave plausible deniability to, right? Every Western leader knew who they were, right? What it gave was plausible deniability to the West to not act right? They knew who these people were, but it gave them deniability not to act because there's enough disinformation out there that they don't have to act because they don't want to go into Ukraine and, and have to engage there. And so it allowed them plausible deniability. And then by the time it's clear who they were, right, coming to the defense is not the same as coming to the liberation. Now, I'll pause there to see if you have any follow-on, but I, have, I, can, I can talk a little more on this. Okay, so that, what, that brings to mind for me, uh, so the, the NATO definition of, of an invasion, uh, that Russia's actions really strained that. So being a member of NATO uh, didn't uh, really uh, serve G Georgia's purposes in terms of resisting Russia's actions. It kind of strained that traditional conventional warfare definition that NATO is based on. Right. In, in, in Georgia, right, in part of what led to the right the whole purpose of, right, in terms of what the Russian strategic objectives were, right? Georgia wanted to join NATO. Ukraine wants to join NATO, right? Russia's already, right, we've already, NATO has expanded beyond what they felt was agreed upon back, you know, in 1991. Right. And so this is kind of, but special status, right? Ukraine kind of, and, and Georgia have special status. So they're, they're drawing the line here, right? They will not allow them to join NATO. And so this is, you know, in some ways a hedging strategy, right? So in terms of Georgia, Right, they never wanted to take take over Georgia. Now they pretty much control South Ossetia and Abkhazia, you know, propping up the economies of these semi-autonomous regions within Georgia. But really, severing the border between those semi-autonomous regions and Georgia proper, where before they were pretty, you know, open, uh, and it allows them their long-term strategic objective of really just, hey, Georgia can't join NATO while it kind of has this contested or uncertain border. So for a very low investment right, controlling these territories, or in the case of Ukraine, Crimea, and really Donbass, which is the conflict area out to the east of the country, right, it it prevents these nations from joining NATO, which is really in, in Russia's long-term strategic interest. Okay, so do you think Russia's actions uh, could possibly serve as a formula, formula for other rising powers, like China, Iran, Colombia, to kind of expand their own respective spheres of influence? Yeah, I think what you have to do is you have to look at the national interest of strategies, you know, for each nation to try to understand, right? Really looking at the ends, ways, and means of each to get an understanding. And you'll see some, right, similar type of capabilities employed that we saw Russia do. And some are going to be different, right? Because they're in a different strategic environment. The, the conditions are different as are their national capabilities are different. 
But I think what is consistent that you'll see really between you know, Russia, China, and others is they're going to do what they think they can get away with, right? Putin is very rational in what he does, right? And really they push kind of to what they think they can get away with and they see, and if the West doesn't really react, right, then they just kind of continue to right, up the ante, right? To include, right, a nerve agent attack on a foreign soil, right? How is this not necessarily an act of war, but it kind of falls below that threshold, you know, building islands, right, out in the Pacific, and then building a base on that island, right? And so that's what you see kind of pushing this, and really when there's no price to pay, they'll continue to kind of elevate what they're doing in their national interest, right? If there's no, if there's no repercussions for doing it, they're going to do it. So that's what I think, again, the specific capabilities or how they go about doing that is going to be different, uh, but they're going to push on what they can as long as they, there's no, you know, uh, response to it. So in other words, just, just kind of pushing to the brink to see what they can get away with and then, and then pulling back right before uh, it escalates. That's kind of right. And I would say not even pulling back because they haven't had to pull back, right? In the, in the Sea of Azov, same kind of thing, right? Where the, where the Russians seized, you know, two Ukrainian ships and their crew and fired upon them. Um, it, right. It's about control of the ports, Mariupol and others in eastern Ukraine. Um, right. It's it clearly a violation of the laws of the sea, but yet really no repercussions for doing that. And that was only piece of it, but really it's just delaying commercial ships from going into those ports, costing them thousands of dollars a day, right, impacting the economy of Ukraine, right? So a method of, right, control in Ukraine and in terms of influence operations, it's, you know, it, it's, it's influence elsewhere. Okay, I'd like to go back to the article and look at a, a particular quote that really struck me, Dr. Collins. You argue, and I quote, the, the use of proxies by great powers is likely to increase as it is often viewed as a less risky and less costly way for a state to achieve its goals. Proxies, however, can be difficult to control and a miscalculation can inadvertently spark a major war. So given your experience as a soft professional in uh, multiple deployments, multiple AORs, and your strategic level experience studying this topic, what implications does this have for our soft operators assigned to training and assistance missions? Right, I mean, like, like I said it before, I mean, first of all, right, when you send overt troops over there, it, com it comes with a, a different level of recognition in the international community where working with proxies, right, is somehow below a, a certain threshold of, uh, you know, direct conflict by that state is how it's looked at. Uh, and so that's one of the reasons that you see. Uh, the second is, right, Russia and Putin, Russian mothers don't like seeing their kids come home in body bags any more than the West does, right? That's, that's no different anywhere in the world. Uh, and, and so, right, it's looked at less risky in terms of that, right, for domestic reasons. Uh, but again, international, right, it's, it's less risky because of, you know, the direct blame or something else on it. And it gives you, again, some kind of plausible deniability of, right, we can't totally control the proxies uh, because proxies do what they do in terms of, right, a principal agent problem. Uh, but but it can risk right when when the when the agent goes rogue or something right when that proxy uh, doesn't you know do what's in the interest of that state it can risk el escalation right as we saw in in, in Iraq I mean uh, in Syria you know where a hundred Russian contractors you know started to go towards a you know American and Syrian position right and we had to respond for the defense but that risk escalation or right if a proxy has right a capability to shoot down an aircraft uh, as we saw right in in the early uh, stages of the, the war in Ukraine, you know, what's the escalation or the response going to be, or if you take down a fighter aircraft from another nation, right? So it risks that escalation. Uh, but before you even get there, right, I think it's important, right, to ask if we're not willing to put American lives at risk, how invested are we in the outcome of this and how important is it to our national interests, right? So I think it's often looked at as the easy button. Um, but really, we got to consider how important it really is if we're not really if we're not willing to kind of invest that higher level, uh, and then just recognize, okay, that's that's what it is. Um, but yeah, for U.S. forces, right? I mean, it's just kind of recognize the lessons that we know, right? They can be difficult control, right? When you get to peace negotiations, right? They can, right? They can try to derail the peace negotiations depending on where they, uh, how they feel about right negotiating uh, towards peace, and right, they can risk that escalation to a more significant conflict between the state actors. Okay, so you, you point out <clears throat> Russia is heavily invested in hybrid warfare and information operations in the post-Cold War era. 
what sort of capabilities do we need to invest in to counter future hybrid warfare operations? And then how do we balance this with the other DOD commitments we have worldwide? Yeah, I mean, you know, we talk about being in a period of great power competition. And I, and I ask, are we in a period of great power competition or great power conflict? If you look, if you talk to Russia, right, Russia doesn't distinguish between peace and war, right? For them, right, this, this is a conflict. And, and so, are, you know, are we at a comparative disadvantage if we don't recognize that we are in conflict, right? Not necessarily a lethal conflict. Uh, the same thing in China, right? Manipulating currency, stealing billions of dollars in intellectual property, building islands in, this, you know, in, in the Pacific, making predatory loans, right? That sure looks like conflict to me. Again, maybe not conflict, lethal conflict, um, but, but a conflict. That doesn't really look like a competition, right? Competition implies you're playing by the same rules, right? This is not playing, right? We don't agree what the rules are. It, it's more of a conflict. Um, and it kind of kind of taking a long way to get at the answer, right, about, okay, how do we need to think about future hybrid conflict and future conflict? Uh, I say focus on the conflict that we're in now, right? Understand the potential conflict for the future, but it reminds me of, you know, some senior officers in Iraq during the, you know, earlier in the war saying that the war was degrading their, you know, war fighting skills, it, you know, which, which was mind-boggling to me. I'm like, you're at war, Fight the war you're in. Don't worry about preparing for the war that you would like to fight. Uh, and so some of that, in some extent, is going on now, right? We're, we're focused on this you know, great power competition on future conflict. Well, let's worry about the conflict we're actually in right now you know, with China, which is primarily economic, right? And, and with Russia kind of in this hybrid um, gray zone, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and focus on that, you know, not to the exclusivity of that, but understand that. So when you think about what we have to, where we have to invest capabilities, right? Look at where, right, where those, you know, asymmetries are, where, where those, where they're kind of the, they're, they're kind of at the level playing field, right? Like cyber, right? Uh, those adversaries are, are, are pretty close in cyber, um, right? Electronic warfare capabilities. Right, understanding what their capabilities are, right? Yet we're overly reliant, in fact, you know, more reliant than ever on GPS, radio, computers, those kind of things. So we have to go back to thinking about right basics like camouflage and deceptions, right? How do we hide where we're at in terms of camouflaging where we're at? Or right, deception, right? Maybe you just make the whole area glow so they can't tell, you know, where we actually are, because everything is kind of emanating an electro electromagnetic signature. There's some part of it is technological solutions, but a lot of it is training. And so we need to make, you know, some investments in those technologically, but really think about how do you change your training, right? Do we need to have talks with giant antennas up if the enemy has an electronic warfare capability? They can, you know, identify our location from far away uh, or from unmanned aerial systems. And if they see you, right, you have to immediately move. Otherwise, assume within 10 minutes, right, because they've invested in multiple launch rocket systems. Right, we've invested in precision guided munitions, so they don't have to know exactly where they are. Right, they don't need an exact line of you know geolocate our position as long as they're within a grid square, which is uh, right. They can just you know take out the whole the whole thing. So thinking about how do we invest in really focus on training and those things, you know, te techniques, tactics, techniques and procedures first, and then part of it is what do we divest from. Right, it's important to think about if we're always if we're going to invest in new ca in capabilities based on the enemy, what are we divesting from? And again, I apologize for the length of the answer, but um, a few years ago, I asked a senior officer in Army Futures Command. You know, he was talking about what they were going to be investing in, and I asked him the question, "Okay, what are we going to divest from?" And what was shocking wasn't that he didn't have an answer, but that he never really thought about it. Right, and and so. I, you know, again, you look at defense budgets and you look and the U.S. spends more than the next, you know, 10 nations combined, of which, you know, six are strong allies and a seventh is, you know, India, which is pretty neutral. Um, and it's pretty embarrassing to say that we're underprepared, you know, for any adversary when we out, you know, we're spending three to four times what China does, 10 times Russia does. And we say we, we need more money because we, we don't have an adequate level of defense, Right. What we need to do is be about smarter about our spending and investment and figure out what we need to divest from. Uh, and the Chinese and, and, and Georgians and others have done a pretty good job of this. It's about risk management and, and accepting risk in certain areas. And I don't think we're always that good at that. 
Okay, uh, so you argue in your article, can volunteer forces deter great power war? We explored the deterrent value of proxy and militia forces in small states, notably the Baltics, in your article, beleaguered by, by great power, in this case, Russia. So what is the deterrent value, if any, for proxies? What are the implications for contemporary military operations of future asymmetric warfare as well? All right, so like, look, again, looking specifically at the Baltics here as an example, right? And what role do kind of volunteers play, right? You can kind of consider them proxies, but proxies are often you know, considered to be non-state actors. In this case, right, it's non-defense actors within that nation, but really volunteer militias, those kind of things. So, you know, not necessarily a proxy by pure definition, but, but you know, similar in many ways, right? In, in terms of, right, they're not necessarily controlled by the defense establishment in the same way. Um, but again, Putin is very calculated, right? He, he, he's pretty calculated about what he does. He, he behaves fairly rationally. And, 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 and again, their first defense is right, NATO, right? External balancing, right? How do we balance against this threat? But they aren't sure if NATO will actually come to their defense. Uh, and defense and it coming to liberation and defense aren't the same thing, right? A RAND study showed Russia could be at any one of the Baltic capitals within a week. And again, coming to their defense is, is that the same as coming to their liberation? Uh, so they're, they realize, right, to hedge, they're going to invest, right, internal balancing, right? How do they balance against Russia? And when you have a defense budget that is, you know, anywhere between 1% to 2% of what Russia's is, do they have any hope of deterring Russian aggression? And the answer is yes, right? What we've seen the Baltics do and Georgia, right? Divest from expensive weapon systems like tanks, airplanes, these kind of things, right? They cost too much when you have a 600 or 300 you know, million dollar defense budget, right? Even with an extremely good exchange ratio with Russians coming across the border, they're gonna be eliminated. Never mind, the they're easy to identify, you know, prior to the conflict, and the Russians are gonna to try to take them out immediately. Uh, and so, right, divest from those. And again, standing militaries are extremely expensive for a small, a small, small nation, right? Uh, Georgia has three brigades, the, the Baltic states, same thing, right? Roughly 5,000 standing troops. When you look at one estimate had a NATO soldier cost roughly 300,000 a year, right? Just a single battalion is extremely expensive, right? For what deterrent effect for one more battalion? Um, and so what we've seen them do, uh, the Baltic states really invest heavily in, the, in, in their volunteer forces, right? Um, and again, as a method to deter Russia, what they're communicating to Russia, right? And like I said, it, it only works if the person, if your opponent or potential opponent, right, is rational, Right, you want to increase the costs so that in their cost benefit analysis, they decide, okay, it's going to be more costly coming in. And then once we stay there, it's going to be continue to incur a cost on us. So what the volunteers do is give that capability, right? Instead of taking a week to get the capital, it's going to take you longer. Why? Because the volunteers are everywhere. You can't identify where they are. They're going to have, right, javelin systems, right? Um, you know, anti-aircraft systems, right, that you can't identify prior to the conflict. They could be in the back of their, in the trunk of their car, in their house. And we saw, again, looking at ha what happened in Georgia, the Russians were shocked when the Georgians took down one of their strategic bombers. And so, right, after that, the Russians kind of pulled back their air force, right? So if, if it makes it more costly on the way in, that's part of the calculus. And the second deterrent effect they have on is you're communicating to Russia, right, we know you can take our capital, with or without, in, in, even if NATO doesn't come to our defense, you're eventually going to pull out because it's going to be too costly. This isn't going to be the Cold War where we do nothing. This is going to be your Afghanistan, right, in the 70s and 80s. This is going to be our Vietnam War. We're just going to tire you. Um, and, and, and then, therefore, you're deterred from going in the first place. Why? Because it costs you more on the front end. And then, two, your occupation will just be so costly. Eventually, you're going to have to leave. So your, better, your best bet is not to go in the first place. And again, how are they doing this, um, right? The Lithuanians producing, you know, basically unconditional warfare manuals for their citizens, right? The target audience of that manual isn't the Lithuanian citizens, it's the Russians, right? Communicating to them, hey, if you come across this, Lithuanians having written their constitution, right? Embarrassed from what their little lack of resistance during the Cold War, that, hey, you are required, it's in the constitution to resist any invasion, right? Or in Estonia, running effectively kind of uh, unconventional warfare exercises on the weekends for civilians, right? So that's the effect that these, these forces can have, right? That these 
and, and it's and, and when you look at it from a risk management standpoint and what you have, if you only have six hundred and eighty billion dollars of your Latvia to invest in defense, right? A very, very wise investment versus you know five million dollars for its or five to ten million dollars for a single tank. Okay. So rather than keep building up that Maginot line of conventional forces, we should look at uh, the trade-off and look at these, these other alternatives that you just mentioned. Um, we have a question now from our audience. Uh, how can we and how should we pressure allies to get involved in real great power conflict? As an example, he suggests, maybe we could divest of heavy armor <laughs> if the Germans built more. <laughs> of course, the Europeans, especially French, may get a little nervous when Germans start building tanks. So. How would you respond to that question, uh, Dr. Collins? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it's, I mean, look at the threat and every nation right within NATO doesn't have to have the same capabilities. Again, for them, if it's protecting ports, right? Because we got a power project to come there, right? If we're worried, okay, if, if the focus is on, okay, a Russian in invasion uh, or Russian, right, you know, ex you, know, uh, you know, going into the Baltics or somewhere else and we think we have to come to their defense or liberation or into Poland, uh, then maybe it's protecting the sea and airports, right? And so maybe it's a heavier investment by those nations in some kind of air defense systems to ensure that we keep those ports of entry as a right as a viable uh, solution. And, and I'm not saying divest everybody divest completely for tanks and airplanes, but I'm saying we got to be smarter about where we do invest and what the right what what's the marginal value, marginal return on any on, on any one of those. Uh, and, and so I think it's being you know smarter about that. Um, and, and then broadly, right, if we're focused on, okay, 2% of, right, NATO has to spend 2% on defense, think broadly about what defense means, right? Uh, right, some kind of, you know, defensive cyber capability, right? Maybe those nations don't kind of lump it in with their Department of Defense, but right, it, it's a defense expenditure nonetheless, right? Deferring that capability or anything that kind of deters information operations, right? So again, in that calculus, right, how do you become more effective, right, either um, right, increase the cost so they don't do it, right, and that's through potentially sanctions, those kind of things, right, to deter them or to punish them after the fact, or, right, just making them less effective, right, because you're defended against their, right, information operations and those kind of things. Again, a simple example is, again, in the Baltics, right, a huge, you know, almost 30 percent of the population is ethnic Russian in Latvia and Estonia, but, right, if Russia tries to what they did in Ukraine, right, tries to, uh, uh, right, stir something up or right, support some you know separatist movement there. It's just not going to carry weight. Why won't it? Right, if you ask the, these you know, ethnic Russians who they cheer for in the Olympics, right, they cheer for the Russians. Right, they consider themselves a Russian. They don't consider themselves an Estonian or uh, a Latvian. But right, they look. They like their civil liberties. They like their higher standard of living. Right, than they have with their peers right across the border. Uh, and they see what the Donbass, right, that disaster is. They don't want any part of that. Uh, so as long as these nations, right, don't impose, right, language laws or these kind of things uh, that really, you know, aggravate them, right, Russian influence operations just aren't going to take, take hold, right? And so that's how they counter the message. It's not necessarily pointing out every, you know, falsehood that the Russians are, right, because then they'll just do a new one. Uh, but it's not alienating their population to begin with. And then just the information operations just aren't going to take hold. All right, so we, we're talking about the Baltics. We have another question um, comparing Lithuania to Afghanistan. So he mentions Lithuania has one tenth population of Afghanistan. So in terms of responses, say with Russian, in the event of Russian aggression in Lithuania, would kinetic and violent resistance really be a practical option for us? Yeah, I mean, for, for sure, right? Again, I mean, they, they, you, They've got to resist, right, with what their capability is. They know they're going to get overrun. Um, but, right, just like Georgia, right, when Russia's came into Georgia, they, they fought them toe-to-toe -to -toe and actually fought fairly well, right? They were going to be overwhelmed because of the numbers, but they actually fought better, and that's one of the things the Russians learned is conscripts kind of suck, right? A more professional army is actually a lot better army uh, because the Georgians did fight them well. And so it's the same thing in, in, uh, in Lithuania or any of these nations. Again, right, the idea is to build that force that, first of all, right, that deters it in the first place. And, right, more tanks in Lithuania is not going to deter Russian aggression because they just don't have the, right, their defense budget will never do it, 
right? And so it's right through volunteers, right? Javelin weapon systems, right? Uh, you know, man pad systems to take out aircraft to make it more expensive for the Russians to come in. Uh, and then once they're there, it, it's clear like, right, they're gonna continue to, to do it. Uh, I mean, I guess the other option is to roll over and do nothing, but that's just, you know, that was the Cold War. But if you look, I mean, you know, the Iraqis put a pretty good hurt on us, right? The Af Afghanis, right? Others, I mean, it's, uh, it, if you look at recent examples of the Russians' own experience in Afghanistan, right? Uh, a popular resistance can be pretty effective. And so I think it's one of those, yeah, it's, uh, it hurts for the nation, but it's in the long run, it's the best strategy. All right, we have a couple of other questions uh, that are more focused on the grand strategic level. We've been talking about several specific cases. So the next question is, by coalescing around the idea that we've entered an era of great power competition, have we tacitly acknowledged we're no longer a superpower? If that is the case, what are the implications? Yeah, I mean, we are clearly a superpower, even if we aren't the sole superpower. Uh, so that hasn't changed. I mean, I think what we have to be realistic is about, right, is, is um, you know, despite our, 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 our power and our strength and our economy, right, it still has limitations, right? We, we can't do everything we want. And it's, you know, having a good balanced strategy, right, figure out what our national interests are, how can we achieve those, how can we achieve those with allies, right, um, and, and leverage those. Um, and, and then just prioritize, like, which interests matter the most and which ones are, are the most achievable, uh, and just being realistic in, in terms of that. And then part of that is, right, understanding our call them competitors then, right, understand our competitors and understanding what their strategic goals are, right? And if you look at Russia, right, generally their strategic goal, uh, goal is, right, is to gain more influence, right? It's not to go back and recreate, uh, right, the Soviet empire in a physical empire, right? The, the risk of them going into the Baltics, I think, is extremely low. Again, not impossible. That's why we've got to build deterrent forces and you know forces that are capable of actually uh, inflicting pain if 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 they do come across the border. Um, but Crimea is right. Look look at what they've done over the last few years. Right, they invaded Georgia, but they didn't take any territory. Right, it wasn't in their strategic interest to take South Ossetia or Kazia. In terms of uh, Ukraine, that's a little different. Right, they did want Crimea. Right, for them that is strategic territory. Uh, and, and something the right that, that to understand is, you know, Crimea wasn't always part of Ukraine. Um, Khrushchev gave it to Ukraine in 1954 as a symbol of like, you know, two or 300, whatever years of close cooperation, and, you know, friendly thing. And, and shortly after, you know, in then 1991, when the wall came down and, and all the republics broke away, um, they had to keep the borders that they had at the time, right? There wasn't any opportunity to redraw the borders. I mean, maybe at that time, right, Georgia would have redraw, redrawn it to some extent. Right? But anyway, that couldn't be done. And so, the, and then after 1991, there were efforts on Russia's part to kind of declare that, you know, that was an illegal, right, gift from Khrushchev, right? It belongs to Russia. So Crimea is a little different from the rest of uh, Kiev. That's not to say, right, it clearly is part of Ukraine, but, but Russia views it differently. But it was strategic territory for them, right? The, the Sevastopol base, right? The Black Sea, those kind of things. Um, but that's the exception. Really, it's more about control and influence, right? And so, again, they aren't building a force to go and take over, right? A, a, a force to go take over the Baltics. That's not where we see them investing, right? Um, in Georgia, it was about preventing Georgia from joining NATO in, in the EU. And again, by controlling South Ossetia and Akazi, these semi-autonomous regions in the border, they do that. And what they've done since then, you know, I was there a couple of years ago, they basically, again, these used to be pretty open. Now, you know, completely closing the borders off, you know, for South, for South Ossetia, Akazi has one crossing point. It used to have even as few as two years ago, seven. And really building a, a you know, wall or fence up to shut these off and then making Russian the only language that can be, you know, spoken in any government school, those kind of things. Right to effectively, you know, long term. Same thing in Ukraine, right? If they own Crimea, and let's say, you know, unlikely, but let's say, you know, international community at some point said, okay, got it. it Crimea is yours for all this history and everything else. We just want to return to normal relations. Well, now Russia's lost its ability to control Ukraine, right, and and, and prevent them from joining EU and NATO, which again I think is unlikely. 
Uh, but that's what the Donbass allows him and having this conflict zone in the East, right, allows him to do there. And then really for Russia, it's about influence, right? And that's where they've invested in the influence operation, right? Undermining Western values, right? Dem dem democratic institutions, trying to weaken the NATO alliance. Uh, and so it's less about, you know, during the Cold War, the message of, right, communism was a superior economic and political system uh, to liberal democracy and capitalism, right? We won that. Well, now it's a different, right? It's more about undermining ours and gaining that influence of what they can. But I, again, looking at their strategic objectives and where they've invested in their defense, it sure doesn't look like they're trying to build something that's going to go and retake all these territories, right? It's more about controlling, uh, right, controlling those, you know, what they can and influencing elsewhere. Okay, one conundrum I've always thought about is, you know, in terms of U.S.-Russia relations, we don't want Russia to be so weak they can't police their own sphere of influence. And then we see insurgents, separatists, terrorists proliferate. But on the other hand, we don't want them so strong that they can bully their neighbors, like you say, and, uh, and then minimize and delegitimize collective security uh, um, you know, arrangements like NATO and, and damage our reputation. So wh where's that balance? And where's that sweet spot in terms of U.S.-Russia relations? I guess that's difficult to define. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult to define. And, my assessment and, may not be accurate, according to, you know, my assessment may be off. So. Right, I mean, and, and you also, but you just can't, uh, but we can't concede to Russia either, right? If you look right. at Ukraine, for example, right? Uh, you know, Russia's interest in Ukraine will always be greater than ours, right? It will never, there's no way our interest in Ukraine will ever be greater than Russia's. But that doesn't mean we have to concede to them. Uh, it, it, early on there, when I was going over there, it, 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 an advisory role with General Abizade, uh, back in, when we started in 2016, there was a concept of, uh, you know, come, you know, that was directed, we will only provide non-lethal aid to the Ukrainians. And, and I didn't, you know, I'm in the military 25 years at the time, I had no idea what non-lethal aid is from lethal aid, right? It, it, right, it's, right, how can providing, you know, teaching the small unit tactics be non-lethal, but if we teach them sniper capabilities, that's lethal all of a sudden. And so one of the things we, we, we did is tried to get the, you know, the administration to understand, hey, it, it, it's, it's, defensive, it's defensive aid, right? It, it goes back to the, you know, a miss, missile defense shield, right? Is that purely defensive? Well, if it's impenetrable, well, then it's offensive to some extent because you're not afraid of retaliation, right? So we try to get them to go away from that. But where I'm trying to go is there was also fear that if we provided, you know, too much support to the Ukrainians, well, then right, Russia would ramp up kind of in a realist, right, uh, you know, international relations theory for those that understand it, right, they're going to respond, right, if we go with force, they're going to respond with more force. It, it really, the, and what we saw was the opposite is the case, right, it, it's, um, right, it wasn't going to escalate in a nuclear war. Um, when they were provided, you know, it was, the rhetoric was, if we provided them javelin weapon systems, right, anti-tank weapon systems to the Ukrainians, right, this, it was going to, they were going to respond in kind. And once it became clear that the Ukrainians were going to get anti-tank right, javelins, then, you know, they didn't ramp it up. They just said, well, that's not going to change anything, right? We're still committed to this. Uh, and, and so kind of looking at, okay, this is one piece of evidence that, hey, it wasn't a realist response, right? And, and so if you, you don't have to concede everything to them. All right, we have a question about China. Uh, and I assume he, what he means by IW is irregular warfare. So the question is, Chinese irregular warfare doctrine is unrestricted. Does our limited military-based irregular warfare doctrine prevent us from symmetrically responding to the full array of irregular warfare scenarios? Basically, does our d doctrine constrain us when China's, you know, r running all over the map? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess... I mean, I'd have to, you know, understand what they're talking about specifically in terms of irregular warfare capability, right? It's pretty broad um, rubric. Yeah, you know, if it's building islands in the Pacific and, and lumping that into irregular warfare, right? I mean, there's other methods to counter that, right? Political, right? To 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 try to counter those kind of things, uh, right? Other other limitations that we have, right? I mean always brought up, right, influence operations, right? We're always limited by what we can do, right? We can't just put whatever we want out there because it's, uh, 
right? We can influence American citizens and these kind of things, right? When you have, you know, uh, you know on the internet, these kind of things. Um, or, right, you heard it in Iraq or Afghanistan, right? It's not a level playing field. Why? Because I, there wasn't a mosque I didn't go into in Iraq that wasn't used as a storehouse for weapons, right? Every mosque I went into had was a weapons freaking storehouse, right? Most conventional forces restricted it from going into them, right? Um, but, right, or the Russians, right? In, in Ukraine, right, in the Donbass, where are they going to put their artillery systems? Uh, they're putting them right next to schools, hospitals, these kind of things, right? Trying to use our norms against us. And, it, you know, those are also, you know, right? It gives them certain short-term advantages. Um, but, but I think if we straight stay true to, right, you know, kind of a laws of warfare, respecting these kind of things, right? In the long term, it's, it, it, it's to our strength. And when we try to um, veer from those, let's, you know, using, you know, in enhanced interrogation techniques that aren't appropriate or something like this, it, it undermines us, right? That's not a strength to be able to do that. So I, I generally counter that, hey, most of our, th those weaknesses that you point out are actually, you know, strengths. Yeah, they, they can put us at some kind of com competitive disadvantages in the short term, uh, but in the long term, they're, they're a strength for sure. All right. So we've been talking for a while about great power competition. We've addressed Russia and China. I'd like to change the focus to counterinsurgency. So prepare to shift intellectual gears here, Dr. Collins. Um, we are currently drawing down from several years of coin operations in Iraq and Afghanistan uh, in the wake of September 11th. In case of Afghanistan, we're engaged in active negotiations with the Taliban. So in your article, Welcome to the Jungle, Counterinsurgency Lessons from Colombia, you argue the Colombian model offers military planners several lessons learned. So how did conditions improve in Colombia? as a result of their, co uh, their coin operations, according to your article. Uh, yeah, I mean, so how did the conditions improve in Colombia as a result of coin? Um, I mean, first, right, the violence went down significantly. Uh, I mean, the, the FARC, I mean, it was a sick 63-year-old uh, insurgency that they ended. That doesn't mean there aren't still other groups, right, uh, insurgent groups in the country, right, but they ended, right, a 63-year-old you know, conflict. Um, second piece, right, they gained control of region of the country. They never really control. Um, you know, I was there in 2004. It, it, and at that point, it was like, it, in Bogota, it was like, basically, don't get too far outside of the city limits, or you're going to put yourself at risk of, you know, being kidnapped from the FARC. Uh, and er, earlier on, or, you know, they had a, you know, the, the government, get, you know, agreed, you know, to give them a massive sanctuary about the size of Switzerland, it basically allowed them to train, refit, right, to conduct operations. Uh, and so really, I mean, since then, right, we've seen the violence go down. Government does have more control. But, you know, on the flip side, right, it hasn't stopped the drug production over there. Th those are as high as they've ever been. Uh, and so it hasn't alleviated all the problems. But the violence is, is significantly down and government control is significantly up. So it has been, you know, effective. All right, so what, what's the most effective role the U.S. military can play in a, assisting a foreign military and a weak government to bring about resolution and bring about peaceful conditions in a counterinsurgency environment? What did you do, what lesson did you draw from the Columbia case study in that regard? Yeah, I, I mean, first of all, right, every situation, right, is different, right? You've got to understand the underlying grievances. You've got to understand the, the insurgent group you're facing, right? How are they organized? What weaknesses do they have? And so everything, every one of them is different. So you can't just look at one conflict and say, hey, I'm going to apply what I learned here to the others, right? What you want to do is broadly go about, and this is what, we, you know, what I've done through some of my studies in the Modern War Institute, right? Going to Sri Lanka, understand how they ended their counterinsurgency. Going to Colombia, understanding they are going to failed examples and seeing what you can learn, kind of looking across them broadly. Um, and, and so one lesson, again, you know, we've learned over and over again is, right, if it comes to, you know, really advising on a counterinsurgency, right, we, we can't want it more than they want it, right? It, it's just never going to work if we want it more than they do. Uh, the other thing is really it's best if it's, you know, the by, with, and through in terms of special operations, right, what we call foreign internal defense. And for the Colombians, it was a counterinsurgency, but for the U.S., it was a foreign internal defense mission, right, enabling the Colombians to be effective. 
Uh, and so it's always going to be better if we are at the kind of foreign internal defense, you know, primarily by our soft or maybe the SFABs, if, if that's a capability that they have, that this uh, security force assistant brigades. Um, but when it gets to the point of our forces, right, our conventional forces actually conducting the counterinsurgency, it's going to be extremely difficult, right? Because we've kind of gone beyond that point of kind of working by, with, and through and doing that. And so avoiding those situations, again, you can't always avoid them. And so you uh, and so you got to do that. And so one thing I think that's important that we've learned is, um, right, we purged after Vietnam, we pretty much purged counterinsurgency from our doctrine. And we said we'd never do it again. And, 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 and you know, and, you know, in some ways it was, we will make sure we are so incapable of doing it that no one will ask us to do it, right? Which is a good theory until you have to actually do it and then you're not capable of doing it. Um, but right, educating, right, making sure we have leaders that understand the challenges of it and not doing things like CPA orders one and two in Iraq that basically disbanded the entire Iraqi security apparatus, right? No one in their right mind that understands counterinsurgency would ever do that, right? Let's disband the entire security apparatus of a country. Well, if they don't have it, who's got to do it? Well, then we have to do it, right? And we don't want to do it. We want to get out. Um, and so part of it is, okay, Key is to educate, right? Making sure we're educated. Um, but again, you know, what lessons were learned specifically there in terms of, right, how to do it? You know, again, as much as you can do, you know, they think the total investment in Plan Columbia, uh, Plan Columbia is about $10 billion, right? A fraction of Afghanistan and Iraq. Again, different scenario, different environment, um, but, but it was effective there. And, and so it's really about, you know, trying to, Right, enable the host nation to do it and accepting their limitations and not expecting too much from them or, or having too high of an expectation of what the eventual outcome can be and, and letting the nation do it as much as possible. It was a pretty remarkable uh, case study. It, it opened my eyes to quite a bit. And I studied COIN in graduate school in the Vietnam War under the Kennedy administration uh, in the case of the British in Malaysia. Um, and it's interesting how every country, yeah, the, the, it's hard to define historical analogies present a problem because it, it's every country is different and every insurgency is different. There's different grievances and different um, operating conditions. So is there anything we can derive from Colombia toward achieving a sustainable peace in Afghanistan in your viewpoint? Yeah, I mean, without a doubt, I mean, first, you got to look at, okay, what are the similarities between Colombia and, right, Afghanistan? I, I think there's a lot, right? Geography, right? Similar size. Yeah, one nation's 50% bigger than the other, but still big nations, porous border, mountainous terrain, right, that, that, that allow ample safe haven for an enemy and limited government control, right? Both ideologically based conflicts, or at least initially, you know, significant portion of the population sustaining their living through agriculture, right, with the production of drugs being profitable, um, and weak central governments, right? And so very, you know, similarities that we, that we find there between them and, you know, other, other examples as well. But, you know, some of the lessons that we can take away from there is, right, ending civil wars requires patience, right? 63 years for the FARC, 33 years in Sri Lanka against the Tamil Tigers, right, LTTE, right? These take a long time, right? Outright victories are difficult to achieve, right? In counterinsurgencies everywhere. And so that's often should, you know, shouldn't be the expectation. It should maybe be the goal, but not the expectation from the onset. They really are hard to end with a decisive victory. Uh, but one of the things the Colombians did and how they really in this was right, bargaining from a favorable position, right? They really ramped up their offensive going into the negotiation conducted cross-border raids to kill a FARC leader. Um, again, the cross-border raid could be effective. It, it might come at a political cost, but they really ramped up that effort and understood the FARC as an organization where taking out the leaders there could be extremely effective. And that may not be the case for, for something like the Taliban, but understanding right the organization and, and what is applicable. Right? In terms of the negotiations, what we can learn from there is negotiating behind closed doors is important. Right? There were media releases nearly derailed the peace process in Colombia, right? The same thing, uh, well, well, you know, could happen for Afghanistan, right? Media releases, are, right? Anything gets out, right? Because nobody wants to negotiate with, you know, the, the, your 
right, your adversary, but oftentimes to end a conflict, you have to do that and come to a solution that's not going to be agreeable by everybody. That's why it's a compromise, right? Because no one really likes it. But it's, the, it's probably the best solution you can get. But releasing those before an agreement can be released isn't going to be helpful. Uh, the other things that, you know, that in, in, Columbia, uh, in Columbia, right, we weren't part of those negotiations, right? It was the Colombians and the FARC negotiating, right? In Afghanistan, right, it's got to be, right, the Taliban negotiating with the Afghan government. Right? Maybe we have a role to play, but the Afghan government has to be involved. And at the beginning, that, that wasn't really taking place. Um, again, other things from Colombia, right? You know, when you think of what we call DDR, right? Disarmament, demobilization, and, and reintegration. Reintegration is extremely difficult, especially in a society without a lot of, you know, economic, you know, job options, right? And so if they don't, if they don't, former insurgent, right, former fighter, if they don't see a, a different livelihood, well, maybe they'll return to violence because it's the best option they have. So reintegration, you know, we've seen is challenging there. They've done a, you know, a pretty good job, but they didn't invest in, you know, into the reintegration realm as much as they had, would have liked. Um, and so it, it, it can be challenging. Other piece in Colombia, right, is, you know, there's got to have some kind of power sharing agreement. In this case, the FARC, wasn't uh, overly popular. They got certain guaranteed seats within their legislature for, you know, basically over-representation in the legislature for the first uh, few terms following the agreement. But, right, you've got to come to, you know, some kind of power-sharing agreement to give that adversary some vote in government or it's not going to work because then fighting is going to be a better option than negotiating. So those are some of the things that we learned, you know, from looking at Columbia. All right. We have hit the gamut. Dr. Collins, you've done a deep dive on three articles you've written. Is there anything else you'd like to add to our discussion? Oh boy, you asked me too open ended of a question. So, uh, <laughs> the hardest I, question yet, right? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I would say, you know, it's important, right? I mean, this, it, because of the complexity of the world and everything, today, that's why it's absolutely critical that we've got to invest in intellectual capital, which is what the purpose of JSAL is. Right. Um, because it, Every environment is so different. You can't just, even if you know one thing, you can't just apply it, right? You got to have a broad understanding of, of conflict, right? What are the goals of, you know, strategic goals of what the, your adversary is doing? Because then you can understand why they're doing what they're, you can't really counter what they're doing if you don't understand how that fits into their larger strategic goals. So, you know, more and more, right? When we were, when I was a young platoon leader, all I needed to know was how to go and do a defense to defend against the Russians and then kind of, you know, move into the offensive. And the plan was there. It was just kind of falling into a larger plan. Now our junior leaders have to know so much more. And so it's absolutely critical to kind of, you know, stay smart and kind of in, in invest in your, you know, self, uh, self-improvement. Okay. So thanks for sharing your time today. Um, I'm sure the audience and, and everyone uh, found it very enlightening. So I'd like to remind the audience, if you found our discussion uh, productive, I encourage you to look at our curriculum and course dates at the JSAL public webpage at socom.mil slash JSAL and uh, click on courses and uh, you'll see a host of offerings about a lot of the topics we discussed today and also take the time to explore JSAL press publications on this and similar topics. So for feedback on Think JSAL or to nominate potential speakers, please contact us at thinkjsal at socom.mil. This series is brought to you by the Strategic Studies Department of the Joint Special Operations University. Thank you all for listening.